Hi there. This uh, video is on DNA replication and packaging, and then a subsequent uh, video right after this one will be on further about packaging and also about segregation of the chromosomes and other um, uh, collections of DNA. Uh, first, a little bit about um, the nomenclature and the evolution of uh, polymerases. So for DNA replication, uh, you have DNA-dependent DNA polymerases. Uh, DNA polymerase is the primary one, and there are several of these polymerases varying by um, other protein factors that uh, help them along. But these use uh, RNA primers in vivo, so you can sort of sense um, their origins. Uh, there are also DNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and this would be RNA polymerase in bacteria uh, and archaea, and also Pol1, Pol2, Pol3, and there's actually uh, Pol4 and 5 uh, in eukaryotes. Um, so you can also see some of the uh, uh, evolution of those too, just in uh, what they do. And then there are RNA-dependent DNA polymerases. These are the reverse transcriptases that you find in uh, viruses, transposons, and then in telomerase uh, for larger chromosomes in, in eukaryotes, linear chromosomes. And then finally, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, uh, such as RNA replicase in viruses. Now, all of them are related in an evolutionary sense. So here you have a, a cladogram of those. So originally you have these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that you still see uh, in some viruses, and those would have originated back here in an RNA world prior to about 4 billion years ago. Uh, then you get these RNA-dependent um, DNA polymerases. So now you're, you need DNA, so uh, you're using an RNA template to make double-stranded and single-stranded DNA viruses here, and those are the reverse transcriptases, and those predated uh, RNA polymerases, which are DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And finally, the DNA-dependent uh, DNA polymerases, such as DNA polymerase, uh, which still uses RNA primers back here uh, for uh, starting um, the polymerization reactions. So, especially the central portions of uh, each one of these polymerases are, are similar in that they have uh, regions where they attach to the DNAs and then they polymerize based on whether they're using uh, RNA nucleotides or DNA nucleotides. Uh, but in essence, that central core uh, is, is very uh, similar. And then you have the outside pieces uh, outside uh, subunits uh, that can be quite different one from another to attach to different parts of the DNA and or the RNA. So in talking about DNA polymerase and how DNA is built up, here's a double-stranded DNA molecule with the 5' prime phosphate end and the 3' prime hydroxyl end, OH, would be down here. And then on the other strand in the opposite direction, the phosphate running from one and to a hydroxyl end down here. Uh, and so they have to be built only in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, so you'd add to here, that hydroxyl there, or this hydroxyl here, uh, building those together based on uh, base pairing of the A's, T's, G's, and C's. So probably by about uh, 3.8 billion years ago, uh, DNA had become the primary uh, holder of genetic information. So then you needed a way to copy that, and the high fidelity was due partly to the fact that DNA was uh, protected by forming a double helix, uh, and also since there were two strands, uh, there could be not only uh, polymerization, but also checking for any mutations uh, in that DNA uh, double strand. So, as I said, uh, the addition is always to, to the hydroxyl end and not to the phosphate end, the 5' prime phosphate. And the components that are added are uh, nucleoside triphosphates. So, this, in this case, it's a uh, DNTP, or in other words, a deoxynucleotide uh, triphosphate, a 3-phosphate three, three uh, three group. Uh, in this case, it's a thymidine base. But it's only that first um, phosphate 
that becomes the phosphate in the chain and the other two phosphates come off so it releases pyrophosphate. Uh, this pyrophosphate as it's released also becomes inhibitory of the reaction so there's actually another uh, protein that picks that up and then uh, uses it uh, to phosphorylate other ATPs or send it other other places in the cell but this sticks to the same place on uh, the um, polymerase molecule, so if enough of that builds up, then it inhibits the reaction. And since there are two strands of DNA, uh, you can copy both at the same time, uh, but it's in a semi-conservative way, so that one strand is used as the template for building the other strand, uh, the, new, uh, the other new strand, and the other strand is used to build the opposite new strand. So then in the two new molecules, one of the molecules is uh, from the original DNA uh, double helix, and the other one is a new strand, newly synthesized, and the same for the other one, but in the opposite uh, uh, sense. Um, polymerization uh, begins uh, to in the middle of the DNA to form a replication bubble. So here you get um, polymerization in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction on that strand and in the 5' prime 3' prime direction in this strand. But um, on the, in these two areas, there's a bit of a problem because you can only synthesize in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, not in the 3' prime to 5'. Prime. So these have to be polymerized in short little segments. So you start uh, replicating here and here and then replicating here and here as the bubble becomes larger and larger. And remember, these are also um, uh, primed again by a primosome that has an RNA molecule in it. So that has to be digested away and then the last little pieces are put together by DNA ligase. So here are a few details of that. So one strand uh, which is continuous, 5' prime to 3' prime, is called the leading strand but then there's something called the lagging strand here. So that um, this piece was built uh, first or replicated first. As this opened up, then that one was replicated, then that one was replicated. Um, these uh, RNA pieces then are usually read through uh, so that in the end uh, those are displaced or uh, degraded. And then in the end, uh, DNA ligase patches those um, DNA molecules together. So this uh, lagging strand then is put together. But you can see for a while in these um, replicating molecules, these short little fragments called Okazaki fragments. So here are a few more details. Here's the uh, leading strand here, copying the DNA. And then the lagging strand with this um, polymerase going in the reverse direction and putting together these small uh, fragments of DNA eventually to, to be put together by ligase. But at this leading edge, then certain proteins are needed for a certain function. So there's a helicase that unwinds the DNA, there are DNA binding proteins, and then there's something called a topoisomerase that uh, untwists the DNA so that it opens up the two strands for replication. And this shows a few of those molecules in more uh, detail. So here's the helicase that, un that um, opens up the two helices. This is a topoisomerase that untwists the DNA so that it relaxes so that that helicase can open those. And then single-stranded binding proteins here are to stabilize those single-stranded regions. There's the leading strand with the polymerase on top of that, and then uh, the lagging strand with uh, where the DNA polymerase would sit. And there's the primosome prim priming the next uh, region with the RNA molecule in it. Um, and then uh, DNA ligase, which seals up those um, gaps uh, between the last two nucleotides in that chain. And a few years ago, people discovered that uh, the two polymerases, one on the leading and one on the lagging, actually um, uh, adjoined one to the other. And so they were together so that here you have the DNA polymerase on the leading strand, there's the one on the lagging strand. And um, in doing so, they had to sort of fold out uh, 
one region of the DNA to stay together, and the and that's how DNA polymerization uh, occurs, at least in the study that was done. So there's a primosome to prime the next region to be um, replicated. There's the single-stranded binding proteins, the helicase doing the unwinding, and the topoisomerase to do the untwisting, and then there's the DNA ligase um, sealing together those two short strands to become a longer strand. Uh, and here they are sort of more in a, a two-dimensional or almost a three-dimensional where you can see they're staying together. Uh, and then this area is folding out. Once that uh, this part is, is copied, then this flips back to the next primosome and then starts polymerization there. So it kind of um, feeds out here, pops back in, feeds back out, pops back in. So there's sort of a, a ratcheting effect on that lagging strand as far as the uh, replication goes. In the uh, cell cycle then we're talking about this S phase or synthesis phase. So uh, during the G1 the um, bacterial chromosomes are not replicated yet and then you have them go through uh, DNA replication going essentially from a 1C level to a 2C level. Uh, and then they're in a 2C level here in G2 and then undergo fission uh, to go from a 2C level back to two cells with a 1C level or one copy of their genome or in most cases one copy. Uh, here's an E. coli cell where They've been lysed in a certain way so that the DNA comes out, uh, but it does the cell doesn't completely come apart. So all of that DNA uh, is originally uh, enclosed inside of that bacterium. It looks like that's impossible, and, and actually uh, because of the way this is um, prepared, it is sort of impossible because in order to make the DNA visible, you have to coat it with, and I've talked about this in, in lab also, in the lab portion of, uh, of my cell biology course, um, that this is coated first with cytochrome C, which is a positively charged protein uh, that coats the DNA. And then uh, a, uh, another compound is used, usually urinal acetate or something like that, uh, with a heavy atom in it, uh, uranium. And then finally coated with uh, palladium platinum, again, uh, electron dense metal, uh, metal uh, atoms that then uh, make the DNA visible, but it also makes the DNA much thicker than its actual size. So yes, this can actually fit inside the, that bacteria with plenty of room to spare, but not with all of those uh, other uh, electron-dense molecules coating it. In the case of a circular DNA chromosome, such as that found in E. coli, or in most E. coli cells, uh, there's an origin of replication here, where you get the leading strand starting in the origin and working its way on both strands outward from there. Uh, and then the lagging strand also is following up on that other strand in both cases until you have two new um, or semi-new molecules. So in, in this upper case, then that outer strand in one direction is the old strand from the original DNA molecule. And the darker one uh, is the new strand that's been built. And, and the opposite is the case down here where that inner um, uh, DNA strand is the old strand and the other outer one is the newer strand that's just been synthesized. And this is frequently uh, referred to as the theta form um, replication because it looks like the Greek letter theta with these two replicating strands out here. There's the uh, replication fork here and here and you can see it in this electron micrograph or actually it's a uh, electron micrograph of a um, radioactively labeled um, uh, replicating chromosome. So a replication fork there and here, and these are the two uh, newly synthesized uh, DNAs over here, and this is the rest of the molecule that to, uh, left to be, um, or yet to be uh, replicated. Uh, it's actually called this Cairn structure also because this was done originally and found by uh, John Cairns. So that is just one form of DNA replication, but there are other forms as well.
Here is another form called rolling circle replication, and it's used by some viruses, viroids, and others. So there's a replication start site here, um, and to initiate uh, replication, uh, an enzyme cuts in, uh, comes in there and cuts one of the strands. Um, so there's a nick in the DNA. Next, um, DNA polymerase comes into that site and starts um, replicating uh, the leading strand. And in doing so, it displaces the other strand. And that strand becomes the lagging strand. And so you see replication uh, near the end and then more replication here. Eventually those will be joined together uh, by um, DNA ligase, just as they would be otherwise in any replicating DNA molecule on the lagging strand. And so this continues producing uh, genome after genome after genome along a uh, linear piece of DNA. So it's concatamers of the uh, genome reproduced over and over and over again. So this is the one uh, used by lambda phage in uh, E. coli to produce many um, copies of its genome. And then a different enzyme chops at those cos sites in, uh, that are at the ends of each of the genomes and packages that into a phage head. Um, there's another form of uh, DNA replication called recombination dependent replication or RDR. And it's used by some viruses as well as some mitochondria, possibly some plastids also. And it may be used by bacteria as well. So to start out, you have uh, different sizes of chromosomes, but they uh, represent the same um, pieces of DNA. So they line up and then one strand invades one of the other strands on the other uh, partial chromosome. So this is just like uh, recombination normally occurs in uh, all cells. The um, uh, one strand then starts replicating uh, that other strand of DNA. So now you have what's called what looks like a D loop in there. And that would be the uh, leading strand then. And the other strand uh, that's been pushed out uh, becomes the lagging strand. So then you get uh, polymerization here and then another polymerization there and then another one there. And those are joined together by ligase again. So it's, just, it's the same uh, enzymes that are used for this that are used in standard uh, DNA replication. So then uh, those two molecules there are then replicated completely but you still have a crossover in the middle that needs to be resolved. So it can be resolved in a couple of different ways. One is to simply cut across here uh, and separate those. So now you have two uh, more or less equal chromosomes, although there's a heteroduplex region in, in the middle, just like you'd have in normal recombination. Uh, you can also uh, cut here and create uh, these molecules here. So there's one that looks like one of the originals, another that looks like an original, and then one that's an extension uh, of those two molecules. So you have three different uh, varieties of uh, chromosomal fragments then. This type of uh, replication is known to occur in plant mitochondria and probably some other mitochondrial genomes, so that you never have a large circular chromosome. Uh, just as, as maybe its ancestral bacterium had. But instead of having a large chromosome, they have fra a fragmented chromosome. So it's in many pieces, uh, and there are many copies of each piece, uh, so that uh, it, the genome size really is uh, uh, difficult to measure in many cases and can be quite large because of these fragments and repetitive sequences within those fragments. And although it has been demonstrated in some viruses and viroids, uh, as well as mitochondria, and to a certain extent in some chloroplast uh, genomes, um, in some bacteria, including E. coli, uh, this may also be used as a way to replicate the chromosomes and the genome. So let's look at some of the ways that um, 
bacteria and archaea uh, segregate their chromosomes. So first you have a chromosome that's physically attached to the membrane by a protein. Uh, you can think of this as analogous to the centromere of a chromosome, but it's not called that in bacteria. But it, it still is attached. So there is uh, some organization of the chromosome in the bacterium. It isn't just floating around in there uh, in a random order. Then uh, replication begins of the chromosome, and uh, there's a duplication of that protein that attaches the cell to the membrane, and the membrane begins growing in the, ba in the bacterium. And it grows from the center, not on the end. So it's growing from here in the center, which push, pushes those proteins, and, and thus the chromosomes, uh, away from one another. So now the two chromosomes are nearly complete and they're starting to separate. Uh, they've both been, uh, uh, they've been replicated, moving further apart, uh, and they're uh, actually taken to the pole. So not only is the membrane growing in the middle, but these proteins are also being moved by internal components within the bacterium to the ends of those uh, um, growing, that growing cell. So they are finally taken uh, to the ends of the, that cell, and then you start getting invagination of the cell membranes and cell wall components. And by the way, the, the middle of that cell is still weaker than uh, cell walls and membranes on, on the far side. So actually DNA and other things can leak in there occasionally. And, and if you're doing recombinant DNA, that's where the DNA enters. And that's why when you're trying to uh, transform a, a bacterial cell, they have to be dividing cells. So you have those weakened portions of the cell membranes and cell wall. And then finally, those invaginations meet in the center and fully um, seal off each one of the cells from one another with membrane and cell wall materials. And so this continues uh, for as many um, cell divisions as uh, is permitted by that particular bacterium in that environment. Uh, by the way, binary fission isn't exclusive to bacteria and archaea. There are many eukaryotes that also divide by uh, binary fission. And one of, them, one of those is trypanosomes, uh, which are a primitive uh, within, within a primitive group of, of uh, protists uh, and their parasites on humans and other animals as well. But they, they divide, in, at least in one part of their cell um, cycle, uh, by binary fission. So now before I go to the next section, there's a bit of uh, nomenclature uh, that I have to deal with. So uh, the first thing is that C, there's a C number, that equals the normal haploid amount of DNA. And originally the C standard for constant. We know that it's not constant now, but that's actually what it stood for. So in humans, the haploid amount of DNA in a nucleus uh, is about 3.2 to 3.7 billion base pairs of DNA. And the diploid amount would be double that, triploid would be tr uh, three times that, etc. And then polypoid means that it's multiples of C. So if I say the cotyledon of Vishafaba is 90 C, that means that you have 90 times the haploid amount of DNA in that nucleus. And that's what you have primarily in cotyledons. N is a different number, and that's the number of chromosomes. And C and N can vary from one another. So that's one of the main points here that uh, you can have a certain n number and have a different amount than uh, what the number uh, of the c units is in this case. So in the human case, uh, 1n equals 23 chromosomes per haploid nucleus. 2n is 46 chromosomes. In mouse, the 1n is 20. And in broad bean vishafaba, it's 6 uh, chromosomes per haploid, or 12 per a diploid cell. And you might be thinking that uh, 1n would be have a haploid amount of DNA and 2n would have a diploid amount of DNA. That's not always the case. And so I want to show you a little bit about how those can vary.
So here's the normal condition in bacteria and archaea, for most, anyway. Uh, binary fission, you have a 1C level uh, and a 1N uh, level of the chromosome. That's built up to the 2C and 2N amount. And then the cells divide and you're back to a 1C, 1N level. However, in many bacteria, they can become polyploid. That is, you can take a 1C level uh, in at one point and start replicating the chromosome over and over and over again. And those can become polyploid. So the cell is multiples of C and multiples of N. And if furthermore, if the chromosomes don't come apart, they can be what are what are called polyteen. And so in that case, you might have a, a 1N number of chromosomes. They're all bunched together as one unit but a multiple of the C amount in that cell. So that's where I say you can get a variance between the C level and the N number. And when I talk about how this is done in um, eukaryotes, uh, it'll be even more apparent what I'm talking about. If you've ever heard of uh, Drosophila salivary gland um, polyteen chromosomes, that's a case where you have a haploid uh, number or some, or a diploid number of chromosomes, but the chromosome has been uh, copied multiple times, and all the all those uh, chromosomes are bunched together as one unit, and so you have a haploid or diploid number of chromosomes, but a polyploid amount of uh, DNA. Uh, there's also a case in bacteria, and I'm not sure if it occurs in archaea, but I know it occurs in bacteria, is that you can get extra chromosomal amplification. So small pieces of the chromosome can bud off from the main chromosome and start amplifying, to start replicating on their own. And then uh, one of those, or multiples, can reintegrate into the chromosome at a later time. Uh, this was first discovered uh, in the Eight, uh, 1990s, 1980s and 1990s, uh, where some bacteria um, were left on a shelf for a while in, in a culture. They overgrew the culture, and so they were stressed. And when the graduate students and professors came back, uh, they tried regrowing those um, cells, and they would regrow on a medium that they shouldn't grow on because they were mutants. So they'd actually converted. Um, the genome had m mutated and converted to um, grow on that particular medium. So it was almost as if it was a Lamarckian type um, uh, inheritance or evolution. And so they went to uh, try to study what was going on. So uh, this was studied uh, by someone that I knew, actually, uh, back when we were both students at the University of Oregon. And, and she eventually discovered that what was happening was when uh, E. coli and other bacteria are stressed, they actually will bud off little pieces of their DNA, um, amplify those, and uh, try to, and they actually turn down their uh, DNA correction mechanisms, so they mutate more often. And if uh, over time, um, many mutations and mutations within the population, they'll actually mutate to uh, find a, um, a gene mutant that can then um, allow them to grow on that medium. So it's sort of like an accelerated Darwinian uh, evolution, but at first it was looked on as, is this Lamarckian evolution or not? So uh, then there's another way that uh, DNA can be replicated, and that's in plasmids. And so these are autonomously replicating pieces of uh, unique DNA. So it's DNA that doesn't exist on the chromosome. It's extra pieces of DNA that are able to uh, replicate themselves. And sometimes um, Certain bacteria have multiple chromosomes, and some of those chromosomes sort of span the size between being a chromosome and being a plasmid. So there's almost a continuum of uh, sizes here, uh, spanning from chromosomes to uh, large plasmids to small plasmids. And even some bacteria have um, up to two to five chromosomes. So 
there are variations that way as well. Uh, plasmids often carry antibiotic resistance genes or heavy metal resistance genes, and so, and they can also be transferred from one individual to another and even one species to another, and that's why uh, often it, with antibiotics, anyway, in antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, they can rapidly um, spread that antibiotic resistance throughout a population or from one species uh, to another. So here's a cell cycle indicating uh, where these little shunts are, or these differences. So um, all of these changes have to relate to the cell cycle, and so and they do. And, and many markers on this cell cycle have to do with specific genes and gene products. So some of those things have been found and have been important in uh, different disease um, and physiological and developmental uh, studies. So here's fission here. You go from a 2C to a 1C level. This is G1 where they're in a, a 1C uh, amount of DNA. Some uh, bacteria and archaea can differentiate into different cell types. Those that don't uh, go through the S phase where you're increasing the amount of DNA from 1C to 2C. And then in G2, a 2C, and, a, uh, and then into fission to reduce the amount of DNA to a, a 1C level. So endoreduplication involves going up to the end of the S phase and then skipping G2 and fission. So you go back here. Now that cell already is at 2C, you double that to 4C and then to 8C, etc. to become polyploid. Amplification has to do with um, sort of going through one part of the S phase of uh, the cell cycle many times over and over and over by pulling off um, a small piece of the chromosome and having that replicate many times. So now if we move on to eukaryotes, they have a, a more elaborate cell cycle in that uh, most cells, but not all, have a mitosis uh, where you go through prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, mainly, you know, assembling uh, the microtubules to carry the chromosomes, de de uh, condensing the chromosomes, lining them up in the middle of the cell somewhere, and then separating them equally into the new um, uh, dividing cells. Uh, and then you get cytokinesis, this K, um, dividing the two cells uh, one from the other. Although, as I indicated, some uh, eukaryotes actually maintain a binary fission type of division, at least some of them, and some of them in just one part of their life cycle. Uh, but here, in, in typical cells, you go from a 4C level to a 2C level. So if we start in G1 with a diploid cell, 2C and 2N, uh, go through the S phase, build the amount of DNA up to two, uh, 4C, in the 4C stage here, they can go into a resting stage or uh, a differentiation stage at that point. And then into mitosis where they, again, reduce the amount of DNA per cell. Uh, note here you can go, uh, cells in, uh, diploid cells can go into uh, differentiation ap apoptosis, that is cell death or a resting stage. Um, some cells are normally haploid, so in, in yeast, many fungi and, and many other types of organisms uh, live most of their lives as haploids, so they go from a 1C to a 2C level in S, and then to a 2C level in G2, and finally in mitosis, where then you have haploid mitosis, going from a t 2C uh, amount of DNA down to a 1C amount of DNA per cell. Um, normally, um, eukaryotic chromosomes um, are linear, so they have a blunt end on the end. Um, not all of them. There are a few that are circular, but most of them are um, uh, uh, linear chromosomes. So when you're replicating a chromosome here, that's easy for this strand to go all the way to the end and finish out. But you'll note that on, on this side, there's a problem because uh, you can only uh, fit a DNA, um, DNA polymerase molecule in here, it copies, then you go down to the next area and, and it has to open up first. Uh, 
and then you start polymerization here, here, and at the end, you can't quite fit a DNA polymerase with its primer and everything on to the end. So with each replication cycle, uh, the chromosome gets shorter and shorter and shorter. So without a mechanism uh, to avoid that situation, uh, chromosomes would have been very small and eventually become extinct. So to build up very large chromosomes, you need to keep extending, keep putting genes in there or uh, DNA to extend that chromosome so it doesn't get shorter each time. And this is done by telomerase, which is a reverse transcriptase. So you all have or had uh, early in your life uh, a reverse, an active reverse transcriptase called telomerase, and it likely uh, originated uh, from viruses, from uh, vi um, RNA viruses that carried along with them a reverse transcriptase because it's very much like viral um, uh, reverse transcriptases. So it carries along with it a primer along with the telomerase and it recognizes a certain position on the end of the chromosome. So when the chromosome stops replicating there, the telomerase sits on there and starts um, make, uh, filling in DNAs um, from its RNA primer and then uh, shifts down to the next one, fills in with DNA, shifts down to the next one, fills in more DNA, and puts on you know somewhere around 200 copies of the uh, telomere sequence. But you'll notice that um, it's only a single strand of DNA that it puts on there. So it need there needs to be something else that builds the other strand. So you have a double-stranded uh, telomere on the end of that chromosome. And that's done by DNA polymerase uh, from uh, the host organism human in the case of you and uh, whatever human it has whatever organism it has to be so the telomerase puts these pieces on it finishes its job and then the end of the chromosome uh, folds around it is somewhat self-complementary dna polymerase pops in there and starts filling this in so you get uh, the dna polymerase um, that eventually uh, fills in any gaps that happen to be there, and DNA ligase then seals up any nicks in those uh, DNAs. There are some uh, congenital diseases where the telomerase uh, is, uh, has mutated so it doesn't work, and so in that case you uh, can have some people who uh, are born and they prematurely age because their chromosomes are getting shorter and shorter, eventually some genes on the ends of the chromosomes uh, start to disappear because uh, they're not copied anymore and that can cause premature aging in those cells and in those people. But if you have normal telomerase your chromosomes would look something like this. So these uh, chromosomes have been stained uh, with DAPI which will stain the main chromosome blue and then a um, a probe uh, that's uh, a sequence that's similar to a, a telomere sequence uh, with a fluorescent dye on the end, so it glows white, are shown here. So on each one of those chromosomes, you see uh, telomere ends on every one of them that protects all of them. So uh, that's the end of this video to, uh, and packaging to this point. Uh, in a subsequent video, the next video, I'll uh, continue with uh, DNA packaging and then also talk about segregation of chromosomes. I already talked a little bit about segregation of bacterial chromosomes uh, during binary fission, uh, but I'll talk more about um, eukaryotic chromosomes in mitosis and meiosis uh, in the next video. Okay, so thanks very much. I will talk to you later. Thank you.